Micron map again, and if you put them together, you get a nice color plot, sort of highlighting different uh, different features. So what we think happening in this region with this, you know, you've got dark uh, uh, darkness there and brightness here. We think it's sort of ov overturning circulation of rising air going up, which forms clouds, makes it cloudy, so it looks bright in the visible uh, and dark in the five microns. And then you've got subsiding branches in the belts where uh, the, the air is moving down, and so it should be dry, and you don't, don't get much cloud. Um, that's then mirrored with this one. Is this going to work? Yeah. So this is taken from Cassini on its approach past Jupiter, and this is showing um, um, a, a time lapse of the clouds moving. And so you can see that these, these belts and zones are regions of alternating east and west um, uh, winds. Um, and you can also see one of the weird things about this is you can see in the middle here these little bright dots. These are little sort of thunderstorms. We know the thunderstorms because you can see the lightning from them. Um, and they, they seem to pop up in these belts, in the belts, which are, we thought, uh, regions of downwelling air. But for some reason, in those regions of downwelling, uh, you get some kind of instability set up, and you, set, you get these little clouds which pop up. And here we go. Uh, come up and then get torn apart by the shear. Um, and just following on from uh, Tony's talk on Tuesday, you know, th certainly the the equatorial zone and the north equatorial belt and south equatorial belt are a bit like a Hadley sail on the Earth. We've got rising air here and subduction either side. Okay. Um, so we had a perfect opportunity with the Galileo to actually find out exactly what the clouds were like. Um, as well as the orbiter, there was an entry probe. Um, and that was targeted to fall somewhere along the, no the, t the, the, the uh, edge of the uh, uh, equatorial zone. Uh, ideally, we wanted to drop through um, a nice cloudy region to get a representative sort of uh, map of what the clouds look like. Uh, here's Katie Capron's probe dropping off down to the atmosphere. Unfortunately, uh, along the northern edge of the equatorial zone, you get these bright spots. They're called um, um, north equatorial bright spots. Um, f they're called five-magnet hotspots. <laughs> Um, and it just so happened, because once, once the probe was released, it, it was on free fall, and it just so happened that this probe fell smack down the middle of one of these hotspots, um, which was unfortunate, um, because that meant we measured a, a region of, of the atmosphere which was not sort of typical. And so that is what we expected. That's what we got. Uh, so we found a thinnish sort of cloud at the 1 to 1.2 bar level, maybe a, a little cloud here. And so that had everyone scratching their heads. Um, if you play around with your abundances, you can get something which looks sort of similar by um, depleting the amount of nitrogen, sodium, and oxygen. So you, we think this upper, upper one is a um, haze. The, the main cloud we saw there we think was nitrogen, ammonium hydrosulfide, and the bottom one may be water ice, but you know, we don't really know. So uh, remote, uh, in situ didn't work, so we have, to, we have to go back to remote sensing. Uh, so remote sensing of clouds uh, on the solar system is tricky. Um, I mean, in thermal infrared, it's, it's almost impossible to do because the planets are cold, so you have to go a long way into the thermal infrared before you get any um, significant radiation. And of course, for most particles, uh, unless they're enormous, their optical depth drops off rapidly with, uh, with wavelength. So it's quite difficult to see them in the uh, thermal infrared. And so the only, really, um, only, only winds we have are at the 5 microns and a smaller one at 7.2. Uh, so instead, we have to look at reflective sunlight. Uh, and look in regions of, of different absorption to see um, the vertical cloud structure and find trying to map what they are, how they're just distributed across the planet. So, this is an observation we've made th earlier this year at VLT with an instrument called Muse, um, and this is a color composite of the typical things. So we've got the red spot there, obviously, but each spot in that uh, image is actually a complete spectrum, going from uh, 480 nanometers to 970 nanometers. Uh, and on, on top here, we've got an uh, image. And what's happened now, hopefully, as I press go, we go, we're going through the reflection spectrum. And this is the image we're seeing at the different wavelengths here. So we get a methane band. Whoop, there we are. Another methane band. You can see the, the, the contrast of the different features alternates as it goes to the wavelengths. So that's pretty nice. Uh, again, yeah. You can see the great spot was really um, was really um, uh, dark in the blue, so that's it's obviously very blue absorbing, which is why it's red. Um. <laughs> so, th so they're pretty cool. <laughs> I, got, I, I got more of these, don't worry. <laughs> um, 
Okay, so to constrain the two cloud retrievals, constrain particle size, but we heard earlier on the week that ideally you want to have as broad a wavelength range as possible you know, to sort of uh, to try and match, because uh, obviously there's a, it's a degenerate problem. We're trying to uh, figure out something difficult from uh, a finite number of data points. Um, but um, solar system observations are obviously disk resolved and cloud features are highly structured. Um, uh, and individual instruments tend to come cover a limited spectral range and uh, and because of that, they tend to be an analyzed in isolation of each other. It's quite rare to get um, um, studies which take a, a broad wavelength range and try to analyze them all together. And that's not just because planetary science is blood, are bloody minded. That's because um, these clouds are very highly structured and rapidly varying temporally with time, right? Um, so it's very difficult to look at the same point on the, on the surface at the same time with different instruments and try and map them together. It's quite difficult to combine together because everything's changing all the time. So that tends to mean that uh, uh, we uh, people have developed sort of ad hoc models which are simple enough to interpret their individual obs uh, observations, but that means there's a whole uh, uh, zoo of different sort of uh, solutions to what the cloud structure of um, of Jupiter and the other solar system planets should be. So, um, in the last sort of you know, 20, 30 years, uh, in the visible and, inf and near infrared, uh, retrievals from uh, Galileo, Cassini, and ground-based in the in these wave ranges have come up with ad hoc mixtures of, uh, of ammonia and ammonium hydrosulfide cloud at about one bar plus a tropospheric stratospheric haze. The reason I said ammonia and ammonium hydrosulfide is that um, it's very difficult to, to uh, identify these spectrally. We'd, all, all we know is we can see something at about one bar, uh, but we don't know exactly what it is. And the reason for that is that, well, I'll come on to this, because of, of this photochemical um, mixing with, with, with the goo coming down from above. The goo is a, a, a technical term, by the way. Um, uh, we also saw with, with the, these observations some of evidence of a small deep cloud uh, in Galileo SSI. And that's this thing here by Banfield and co-authors, where there was th this red, I in it's, it's a color composite image, but this red bit there is, um, seems to be the base of a convective cloud, and that seems to be quite deep down. So that may be the water cloud at sort of four to five bars. In the five micro window, uh, retrievals from things like Cassini Vims and ground based, uh, things like CryRes and uh, Vizier. Um, we find a sort of scattering cloud at uh, one to two bars and a possible water cloud at five bars. If you go to higher resolution, uh, there's an there's instrument, instrument at Keck, uh, which has detected a water cloud at uh, five bars. We think there's a five bar cloud that down there, probably the water cloud, but at the top, we're a bit, bit fuzzy about uh, what is actually right at the top. And finally, um, in the 7.2 mi uh, micron window, uh, Cassini Sears retrievals find a, another cloud at about one bar, composition unknown. So, Jupiter, it should be nice and simple. Uh, we should see the three clouds at the three levels, uh, but in fact, we see a one single cloud at about one to two bars, composition unclear, and a trace of a deeper cloud at five bars. The main cloud at about you know, one bar, it seems, to be, it seems to be too high a temperature to be pure ammonia. Um, so maybe it's because it's, um, y you've got an overlapping ammonia and ammonium hydrosulfide cloud, but if so, why can't we see any hydrogen sulfide absorption? Um, the other sort of telltale is that these ammonia ice features can only be seen in small uh, areas of rapid convection. So this is a another Galileo uh, NIMS observation where um, there are cer certain sort of spectral dips that you'd expect from an ammonia ice cloud. And if you sort of try and map that and do radiance differencing with other things, then in this region to the north uh, west of the Great Red Spot here, this blue area here, uh, is a, the, the blue indicates a sort of a, a spectra uh, spectrally identifiable ammonia absorption. And so we think it, that we only see pure ammonia in regions where the air is, rap is, is coming up really rapidly. And so you're getting fresh material being dredged up from below, forming a nice fresh white ammonia cloud. Hey, I'm ammonia, I'm nice and fresh and white. But then within a few days, it gets covered with the, um, with the goo that's falling down from above. And of course, that goo not only um, uh, masks its spectral features, it probably also changes its thermophysical properties as well. Um, current instrument around... Uh, Jupiter is a Juno, of course, which arrived at Jupiter in 2016, uh, which enters a highly elliptical polar orbit. So these orbits are great for mapping the uh, gravity potential of the planet, and also great for keeping the spacecraft alive, um, because um, you've got these very strong radiation belts around Jupiter, and if you leave a spacecraft anywhere in these belts for too long, they um, everything, the el electronics fries. Um, and so you have to have these elliptical orbits, orbits. And so there are remote sensing instruments on uh, uh, Juno, but they tend to sort of look at Jupiter as it's sort of whisking by like this. And so you get very sort of narrow swaths of uh, observations, which are great and unique, but to try and interpret them, you need to have ground-based support 
to sort of try and fit their observations in with what's generally going on on the planet. And that's why these we're, we're making these VLT MUSE observations that I showed you earlier. We're doing those in support of Juno to try and map generally what's going on in, in, the, uh, in the cloud. So what's Juno been finding? Uh, well, it's been finding, so there was a long running uh, uh, controversy on how deep the winds we see go. Uh, one camp of modelers said, no, it's all shallow. Uh, it, don't, it, it won't go down very far into the planet. Another camp said it's really deep. It's going to go a long way down the planet. And observations of the temperature at different uh, pressure levels, uh, we, we still see significant belt zone contrast in the temperature. And so that suggests that uh, actually the winds do go down a long way down to the planet. And so it's, um, it's very deep, deep uh, circulation. Um, ammonia, well, as I said, we, we thought that these are belts and zones. The, the uh, zones are areas where the air is rising up, making cloud, and bringing ammonia up to the top. And the belts should be regions where the air is going down, um, dragging dry air down and having low cloud. And so you'd expect the ammonia distribution to have the same sort of um, uh, distribution with latitude. This is what um, uh, Juno thinks. He thinks there's a big plume at the equator and then sort of belt zone structure north to south, but nothing as organized. And why there's this enormous plume going from the deep to the top is a bit of a mystery at the minute. Is that ready? Um, eventually, we hope that Juno will be able to tell the deep water abundance, um, but to do that, it needs to, dis it needs, it needs to disentangle ammonia and uh, temperature first, and they're still working on that. So uh, the, water, the, the deep water abundance is still, still to be determined from Juno. Uh, and I said that already. Oh yes, so, 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 so this is a GRAM and JunoCam. I've been obviously looking at the clouds and you can get some amazing things from JunoCam. These sort of things you see, uh, these are all done by uh, amateurs. There's a guy in Germany who really, so, so he's made this his own sort of uh, thing. He's a, he's an, he just does it in spare time for the love of it. And he takes the JunoCam observations, which are publicly uh, released images, and he puts them together, he puts on some very strange color contrast, um, but it does bring out all sorts of fantastic sort of detail, especially around the poles, where you can see these sort of lots of little eddies uh, circling around the uh, north and south pole. And then JIRAM, that's, this is a uh, near infrared observation. This goes from two microns out to five microns. This is at five microns, again, uh, at the uh, north pole. I think it's north, might be south. Can't remember. Um, but uh, you can see that there's um, obviously the swirls of uh, of vortices here, and the, the bright regions are where it's cloud-free, and the dark regions are where it's very cloudy. And so the structure is, uh, all this structure there that we never thought would be there, uh, or never imagined would be there, is uh, being turned up by Juno. Okay, whistling on through the solar system. Uh, Saturn. So Saturn, we expect much the same as we did for Jupiter. We expect to find, again, the same three sort of cloud levels. Um, everything's much more vertically extended for Saturn because uh, the gravity is much lower at these sort of pressure levels, uh, sort of um, nine meters per second squared versus 23 uh, meters per second squared. And so the scale height, you know, the scale height is the um, vertical height you have to go before the pressure drops by a factor of V. Um, so the scale height is bigger, and so that makes everything much more vertically extended. So we expect to see that. What we actually see, uh, well, we see lots of haze and cloud at the one to two bar level, it's probably ammonia, um, but again, no spectroscopic proof. Um, so there's no spectroscopic evidence of these three, these other two clouds either. And in any case, everything is completely obscured with a photochemical haze, which uh, seems to be very thick. And because of the um, low gravity and the, and the large scale height, uh, you get a very large optical depth of haze, and so everything looks very sort of washed out. And, um, and which, is, which is why, if you look at Saturn through a telescope, uh, you don't see much in the way of belt zone contrast. Whereas, whereas if you look at Jupiter, you see lots of belt zone contrast. We think underneath there probably is um, belts and zones, but it's very hard to see in the visible. Anyway, all this uh, difficulty in seeing through uh, has led to a wide variety of cloud models. So this is a review paper by Santi Perez Hoyas from a few years back, looking at different cloud models retrieved through different years. Look, and so generally we think there's a sort of a deepish cloud about one to two bars, and there's a haze. But but you need the all, you need all three components to get a reasonable sort of fit to the uh, reflectance spectrum you get. And generally, there's very little use of ab initio models where you start off trying to model everything from the beginning and uh, and uh, predict where things are, and that's because photochemistry screws everything up. Uh, just ab initio models just don't work, and so you have to use empirical models to try and say something um, um, uh, of interest about the planet. Um, so this belt zone contrast, this, this is a uh, Cassini-Vim's uh, observation of Saturn. Um, it's made up of sort of strips. It's, it's not the prettiest picture, but it's, quite, it's sort of quite instructive because um, um, we're going from the south to the north here, and uh, this is the equatorial sort of zone, and then sort of 
you, know, you, you sort of see traces of lines here going from north south. But when you go to the five microns, you see all this. So this is uh, looking down through the, the haze at the deeper clouds below. In fact, the belt zone structure on Saturn is actually much more detailed than it is for Jupiter. Um, amazing sort of structure here of, uh, of, um, of uh, clouds. Nobody really knows why. Um, it's, uh, but it was again, it's completely unexpected. We, we, we expect to see a nice sort of uniform sort of, you know, five degrees sort of latitude sort of um, structure in the uh, pattern, but it's much more highly detailed. Moving on out, Uranus, the blue blob. Um, so for, these for Uranus and Neptune, we, we expect something pretty similar, actually. Uh, they, they've got very similar temperature pressure profiles, and we think they're a similar sort of composition of um, the material. Uh, and what we expect to see is something very deep, a water cloud very deep down, um, and then uh, an ammonium hydrogen sulfide cloud at pressure of sort of like here we go, 40 bars or so. Depending on whether you have more ammonia or more hydrogen sulfide, Whatever's, whatever gets left over from forming ammonium hydrogen sulfide should condense above up here. In this model from uh, Swisher Treyer, uh, there's more ammonia, and so you've got an ammonia ice cloud forming uh, at the top. And then we expect to have a massive cloud of uh, methane ice right at the top, because me uh, methane is it makes up two to four percent of the bulk composition of um, of, of Uranus and Neptune. So it's a big, a big component, and so it should make a whopping great big thick cloud. What we actually see. Uh, we see a thick uniform cloud at about the two to three bar level. Uh, again, no spectroscopic identification of what it is, but probably hydrogen sulfide ice. We see these small um, discrete clouds, uh, um, sort of storms at this point here, and also this sort of um, zone, uh, zonal structure that formed around the uh, uh, south pole that's going into the equinox, and, and the new ones formed in the north pole going past the equinox, uh, which we think are probably due to uh, methane ice. Um, but no, quite thin, uh, I mean, not huge optical depths, just a few, uh, a, a few optical depths of methane ice. So that means that there's something inhibiting the formation of methane cloud. Um, what that is, no one knows. Nobody knows. Um, Maybe that it's forming so quickly that it immediately rains out. Uh, that, that's one idea that's out there. Um, but another complication for this, of course, is that for, um, uh, for methane, you know, it's making up 4% of the mean bulk of the gas, and so when it condenses, it releases a huge amount of latent heat. So that's going to really um, be a, a challenge to any sort of cloud condensation model. Um, and it also changes significantly the mean molecular weight of the air, of course, because um, as soon as you condense some of that to methane, then the surrounding air then is much as less methane than surrounding air, and so it's going to be much more buoyant. And so it will go presumably. And so I, I assume what's happening with the deep cloud is that every, every time it forms, it forms really quickly and just goes 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 you know goes wild and releases probably a, lo a load of methane rain. But again, uh, the cloud condensation model just doesn't work. For Neptune, so obviously with Jupiter, so um, Vo uh, Voyager had a better time at Neptune. There was, there was something to see at Neptune. So you can see there's uh, bright clouds and uh, dark spots and things. And uh, in some cases, you can see the, uh, the, the this cloud's called a scooter, and that was with a great dark spot there. And last image here was uh, near the edge. You can see that these clouds at the top are the, the sun's from the side here, and you see the clouds casting a shadow on the main cloud deck um, below. So there's, there's, there's detached clouds. Again, we expect to same, see the same things we did for uh, Uranus, the same three clouds. But again, we don't see that. Uh, we again see a thick uniform cloud at two to three bars. Um, again, can't tell what it is spectroscopically, but probably hydrogen sulfide. We see these um, methane um, uh, ice clouds in the sort of 800 to 200 millibar region. Um, and f and uh, uh, Neptune has a much more in the way of um, of, of uh, photochemically produced haze. There seems to be a lot more sort of activity in the bottom of the atmosphere, which punches up a lot more methane into the stratosphere, uh, and that obviously gets fertilised and forms all sorts of uh, chemical products like uh, ethane and acetylene and ethane. And as they form and, driz and drizzle down, they eventually get their reach their condensation point and form sort of these, these detached uh, hazes of uh, material. Uh, and eventually uh, will form heavier products and carry on trickling down through here and then coat everything down that's forming freshly down there. Um, so same story for Uranus, basically. Um, uh, we, we expect to see really thick methane clouds. We don't. Uh, we again got the issue that the methane-rich uh, uh, air is going to be much denser than the surrounding air, so how do you get the clouds to form in the first place? Uh, and again, the, our, simpl our simplistic model just doesn't work. So comments. Um, cloud formation on giant planets it's not as simple as we thought. Um, 
And I'm guessing it's probably not as simple as we, as we think on exoplanets either. Um, for, for the solar system planets, uh, it's, it, it's probably because the planets are so cold that uh, photochemical products produced high ab uh, above greatly complicate matters. And the other big thing we ha uh, problem we have with the solar system is that we just don't really know the belt composition very well because everything's so cold, we can't see down deep enough to really determine what the belt composition is. And again, that should be easier for hot planets where uh, everything is well mixed and uh, you can see everything up at the top. Okay, um, moving on to a bit about retrievals and how we deal with all this. Um, so, I, you know, ideally to do a forward model and do retrievals of things, we need to know what the clouds are, um, but we don't know what the clouds are. Um, we, 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 see we know that they're not pure condensates, but we don't know what they're contaminated with. Um, yep. Yes, so you can look at different wavelengths and see how the opacity drops with wavelength. So, that, so typically, I mean, there's, there's probably bimodal distribution, so, so you need a few sort of submicron-sized particles to explain the, uh, the visible near infrared, and then, and then slightly larger particles to explain what you see in the um, uh, uh, one to three micron region. Um, yeah, so uh, clouds are very difficult to identify spectra because um, uh, ice absorption features are usually very close to the gaseous absorption features that are that we're looking through, uh, and the pure ice features are often masked by contamination with photochemical products. Uh, and that picture again, so to remind you that the uh, you, you only see fresh ice where it's where it's where it's rapidly coming up from from the interior. So we don't know what the particle composition is or size. We don't. We've got some idea about the size, but we don't know exactly what the size is. Uh, certainly not from models. We don't know what the shape of the things are. Um, so we're a bit we're a bit, <laughs> we're a bit clueless really. Um, so that led to early retrievals doing all sorts of empirical adjustments of you know, empirically modifying extinction cross-sections, phase functions, asymmetries, single scattering albedo, or combination thereof. Um, and that, you know, that provided the, as nice convenience, you could then fit your observations and say something of meaning, uh, meaning about the clouds, but it wasn't uh, physically consistent. So in the last couple of years, we've been working, uh, I'm talking about Nemesis, this is our retrieval code that a uh, few of us in the room use. It's got a ridiculous uh, acronym. Uh, Nonlinear optimal estimator for multivariate spectral analysis. <laughs> uh, why it's called that, I can t I'll tell you over a beer tonight if there is any beer tonight. Um, <laughs> uh, it was originally developed for the solar system studies um, uh, for Cassini series mostly, but we've, ex we've since extended it for looking at uh, exoplanetary observations and direct imaging. Uh, and the core retrieval code is based on optimal estimation, but we've now got a branch which does Bayesian nested sampling retrievals to fit in with everybody else. But um, Refractive index, we've, we've been um, doing this work now with refractive index retrievals where, you know, because we can't put in what the material is made of, we have to sort of um, try and back it out from the observations directly. And so the scheme we've come up with is to, uh, uh, first of all, we, 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 we have to fix the, the real part of the refractive index to a certain value at a reference wavelength. And then we uh, define a model imaginary refractive index spectrum, uh, and we try to fit that to the observations at each iteration. Um, so we're fitting a refractive index spectrum, and we also try to fit the mean particle size and the size of the variance, so the variance of the size distribution, sorry. And then once we've got an imagined refractive index spectrum and an assumed real abundance, uh, re real refractive index at one wavelength, we can uh, reconstruct the real, the real refractive index uh, using the Kramers Kron equation. It's not absolutely accurate because we've only got a limited wavelength range, but it's, it's sort of moderately correct. And then from that, we can then compute extinction cross-section spectra, single scattering albedo spectra, and phase function spectra uh, using me theory. Um, obviously, me theory assumes spherical particles, as we know. Um, um, we, we're not in a position of trying to model non-spherical particles, but it's a reasonable approximation that if you've got a, a, a suspension of non-spherical um, particles, as long as they're randomly oriented with respect to each other, you can sort of treat them by a, a, a a, a mean sort of uh, mean distribution, um, and so uh, that's what we do. But um, one further thing we do is that because the um, me theory gives you these, uh, the uh, which we heard earlier in the week, we get the the rainbow peak and the phase function and the glory. Uh, to get past that, we sort of fit the uh, phase function spectra we get with combined Henry Greenstein functions, which sort of um, smooths those out. So we've used this for a couple of things um, uh, earlier on, Tony. Tony talked about um, uh, work that Paris, uh, Santa Paris Hoyes did looking at Venus, uh, trying to detect what the uh, uh, UV absorber on Venus was, and that he used this model uh, as well. 
Um, so the advantage of this model is it, uh, it's self-consistent. Um, it works very well. Disadvantages are it works a bit too well. <laughs> um, it's all too easy for the imaginary factor index uh, retrieval to um, to account for all the stuff you can't model by, by everything else. And so you've got to be careful with it because um, you, you might end up getting all sorts of uh, weird features coming up in the imaginary factor index spectrum, which might not be real. So, so you've got to treat it with a bit of take it with a pinch of salt. But it's you know it's 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 better than what was being done, I think, because it is self-consistent. Okay, uh, how am I doing? Sorry. Um, so Uranus. Um, talk a bit about, about the retrievals for Uranus. So uh, Voyager 2 in 1986 found an almost featureless dead world with few discrete bands, few and anything really. It's just, just blank, isn't it? Nothing there. Um, and so that me meant people thought it was dull. Uh, no, not dull at all. Um, it just happens to be that uh, Voyager passed by uh, Uranus uh, close to its southern summer solstice. And Uranus is orbits almost entirely over on its side. Um, and also Uranus has almost no internal heat source, so it's entirely solar driven. Uh, and so what's happened is at that point when the, sun, the, sun, the southern pole is towards the sun, the atmosphere is very quiescent, it wasn't really doing much at all, but as it's moved on through its orbit, so it's now, um, so it got side onto the sun in 2007, and so, so you got the sun is now going from the south pole to the equator to the north pole, and that massively changing solar insulation has led to a massively changing distribution of clouds. Uh, and so as we approached the equinox in 20 2007, uh, we had this bright uh, belt appearing around the um, south southern pole, also discrete clouds here, which we think are convective clouds. And then as we went through the equinox, this, this belt faded, but a, um, a now just belt in the north brightened. Uh, and so we're going through here now to the north where we are, 2014. Uh, and now the, this zone around the pole is getting brighter and you've got lots more convective clouds. And eventually I assume what will happen is uh, it'll get quietened down again when we get to the northern solstice. It'll, it'll all look dead and boring again, and then we have to wait until we move on the orbit. Circulation-wise, um, looking at the near infrared cloud activity, um, we think these bright regions are probably regions of upwelling. Um, but you, 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 you can do cloud retrievals of this, of this. But to do the cloud retrievals, you need to use um, methane as your gas to determine how far down you're looking, uh, which is fine for Europe, for Saturn and Jupiter. Um, but for uh, but for uh, Uranus and Neptune, uh, actually, we should now realise that the amount of um, methane varies with latitude. Um, if you look here in the region of uh, high methane absorption here, you, you can see that it's, it's brighter at the pole and dark here. And you might assume that meant that the hazes were higher over the pole than they are at the equator. But if you look at a wavelength where you've got a different gas absorbing, in this case hydrogen, hydrogen, collision juice absorption, you see no variation going from the equator to the pole. So that tells you that actually what we're seeing here is not due to the cloud getting higher, it's due to the methane getting lower uh, at the pole. So you need to uh, take that into account or you get the wrong answer for your, meth your cloud height. So we seem, to, we seem to have low methane at the pole. If you look in the microwave, uh, this probe sort of moist things like uh, ammonia and hydrogen sulfide and it's darker at the equator and bright at the pole. And so that fits with generally the air is rising up at mid-latitudes, bringing moist air upwards. And then that dry area, dry air, then sinks at the north and south poles, which makes it brighter at the polar latitudes. And that's sort of consistent with thermal infrared, uh, where we're looking at the, the temperature at the, uh, the, the top of the troposphere, uh, where it's bright at the equator and dark at mid-latitudes. And that's consistent with air rising at mid-latitudes and then the air moving towards the pole, then subsiding, and also moving to the equation and subsiding. Okay, I just want to show you this, because this is fresh this year. Um, uh, distant retrievals on Uranus uh, looking for hydrogen sulfide because you know we, we, we know that we've got this cloud at two or three bars we think it's either ammonium uh, either hydrogen sulfide or ammonia uh, it was impossible to tell which for a while in fact hydrogen sulfide had never been positively de detected on Uranus uh, we, th we thought it was there from microwave observations but there's no direct spectroscopic detection so I did some fits to uh, Gemini NIFS with, my, with our retrieval model Nemesis and so I'm fitting the imaginary refractive index spectrum fitting the cloud with the function of height and if you zoom in on the region where we have hydrogen sulfide, um, if you neglect hydrogen sulfide, you get uh, residuals in the spectra, which in this case are the, um, the red lines. And if you look, squint your eyes and look very carefully, you can see that if you add hydrogen sulfide, you get a change in the spectrum which matches the peaks and troughs of the different spectrum. And so we think that means that we've detected hydrogen sulfide above, above the clouds of Uranus here. So we've, we're, we're detecting cloud hydrogen sulfide here, which means that this cloud here probably is hydrogen sulfide. So I was very glad, um, very happy 
Uh, we, we, got, we got lots of press coverage on this. Uh, if you follow of, of, of the media, uh, there's, there's a Have I Got News program in, the, in, in Britain, uh, and it was the last entry in the uh, missing words round, and so I punched the air. Yes, fame at last. Um, you're in a smother rotten eggs. Of course, a lot of the media rang me up uh, to say, <laughs> you really saw the farts, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, like this. Uh, and yeah, people have said to me in the past, Pat, you know, your, your research stinks. Um, uh, and I guess now it does. <laughs> uh, okay, on to Neptune. Uh, so Neptune, this is, this is in uh, get, uh, 89, when Voyager 2 passed by, so we had actually not a lot in the way of clouds. Since then, that's also got more active. Uh, and we have very bright cloud d d uh, belts at the um, 20 to 40 south um, and dark in the middle. For a long time, there was no great dark. There was no more dark spot seen. Uh, we we we'd nev we'd never really found out what that dark spot was, and it and it disappeared completely anyway. Um, there was one found uh, a couple of years ago uh, in HST observations. Uh, so, yeah, th these are all general observations we made. Um, again, looking at different uh, uh, absorptions of uh, methane. We go down deep into. So here, 1.7. You see the uh, the transmission uh, from the cloud to space. Uh, follows that curve there, so we don't see down very far. We've seen down sort of 0.1 bar here, whereas at 1.58 microns, we can see all the way down to sort of two, three bars. And I want to draw attention here to this little spot just there, this little guy, which you can see when it's very clear, but it's not there when you just uh, ramp up the methane absorption just a bit. So this bright polar cloud, um, we, we, we see polar clouds on Neptune quite a lot, but I don't think anyone's ever seen a cloud right down at the main depth before. Uh, so this was a new observation we had. Um, and yes, I promise you more of these. There we go. So this is looking at the Jonas observation again um, at different amounts of uh, methane absorption. So this is the spectrum going from one, uh, 1.48 microns to 1.8 microns or so. And so as you scroll through, you see different uh, uh, features coming and going. So there, there's that bright spot appearing, and it's gone. So that tells you that it's, a deep, it's, it's down at the deep cloud level. And then just this year, we've got data from VLT uh, Muse again. Uh, this is in its new narrow field mode. Uh, and it's in the visible spectrum. Uh, so it looks kind of blurry uh, in the blue. So we're going from um, 0.48 uh, 40 nanometers to 9, 30 nanometers. But as it goes to the longer waves, the radius scattering dies away, and we start to see the deeper clouds. And again, with varying methane abundances, you can see right down deep or just the top of clouds. And so I'm currently working on analyzing those data to um, actually determine the methane abundance again. Oops, wrong one. There we go, right. Uh, circulation, almost done. Um, so, uh, so this is what we're seeing now in, in the sort of visible uh, and, and infrared, sort of uh, dark at the equator, bright at the uh, middle latitudes. And that fits in nicely with the thermal infrared, where um, again, we've got bright at the equator and cold at mid latitudes, which is consistent with air rising at mid latitudes and then moving to the poles. Um, sort of consistent with VR, uh, microwave observations. If you squint your eyes enough, you can just about see it's, 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 it's sort of uh, brighter in there. So that, that sort of is consistent with the, there being moist air coming up at the equator and dropping at the poles. And this is an initial analysis of that um, Muse observations looking for uh, methane. And you can see it's sort of high methane at the equator and low methane at the poles. And I'm currently working to reduce that and make it, make it more uh, quantitative. Okay, so in conclusion, uh, clouds are really hard. <laughs> so good luck. <laughs> um, so photochemistry in giant planets means that the clouds are not at all what we expected. Um, to get any further for this, we, d we need more laboratory measurements of candidate haze absorption coefficients, um, and also we need better actually gaseous absorption coefficients. So they're getting better rapidly, actually. Um, but uh, we're still, some of our work is relying on sort of band model coefficients measured years ago at poor resolution. Uh, hopefully, all this will be simpler for hot Jupiters. Obviously, for exoplanets and brown dwarfs, uh, you need to be you need to use clouds to in order to match your models. But I would, you know, word to the wise, I'd say be a skeptical buyer. I think that came up earlier in the week. Um, nature tends to add the unexpected, so perhaps Occam's razor is a good guide. If you can find a, a simple solution to this problem, that's probably it. Um, I, I would I would worry about making a model too complicated. Uh, and remember, again, word to the wise, just because you find a neat solution, uh, it may not be the only solution, or indeed the right solution, because you might, it might be based upon um, absorption coefficients and other uh, systematic errors that you've 
you know, but it turned out to be not right at the time. So you know, just just be careful when you're doing this and uh, put your error bars on and you know, just just be aware that it might not be right. Um, for the solar system, we've got an obviously an opportunity to actually put all this to bed by sending in uh, entry probes. And there are sort of uh, uh, proposals to, uh, to fly to the giant planets and drop more entry probes in to actually measure the clouds, uh, hopefully this time not in a five micron hotspot, so we actually get the proper the vertical cloud structure. But even then, how many? I mean, is one enough? I mean, if you just measure one place, is that enough? Uh, so ideally, you want to have several. Uh, and obviously, while that's a, um, a possibility for the solar system, not really a possibility for brown dwarfs and exoplanets. So there, you'll just have to rely on remote sensing. OK, that's me done. Thank you. Questions? Uh, let's start in the back with Laura. Oh, sorry, that one. Yeah, it's just haze. So it's, it's, it's limb brightening of the haze. So they've got to the haze is up high, and so a, and in regions of strong absorption, as you go towards the limb, you get a longer sort of path length of haze, and so it looks brighter towards the limb. Yeah. Ryan? Um, so, in, so we specify a certain wavelength grid, and then we specify a certain correlation length between those in the retrieval setup that we, we're doing. So we, it's, 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 it's an optimum estimation retrieval setup for that. There's a question over here. I think more. Th I think it's more of a problem. It's not, not so much distance from the star. I think the problem is um, if it's hot. I, th I think, that th th as I understand it, uh, when you, when you guys have photochemical products, uh, th things that we're talking about here, like uh, ethane and acetylene and stuff, um, they tend to be uh, not stable at higher temperatures. So, 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 so photochemistry will be happening, but whether it will form a haze that will then muck up everything else, I think it's uh, if it's hot, you probably won't get it. But I'm not sure. None whatsoever. Oh, okay. uh, actually, that's a lie. Um, uh, no, it's not a lie. It's, it's so far, none whatsoever. But I've, I've got I've, I've got a, a d uh, postdoc at the moment working on a simple. He's taken a uh, Titan haze model from uh, Pascal Honu, and he's adapting it to uh, Uranus. And that's but even that even that's you know, a, lot, a lot simpler than some of the things we heard earlier on this week. It's so uh, you, you inject you have a certain production rate in the top of the atmosphere. And it just models how the uh, eddy diffusion moves that around. Uh, but we're trying to sort of limit our retrievals to be not, not so completely free, but uh, sort of constrained a little bit by some sort of um, physical expectation from a, a simple model. Mike? Yes. Uh, so I've got, a, I've got a default student working on that right now. Um, so there was a study done by Bob Carson and colleagues in a couple of years ago, where they did laboratory measurements of, um, I think they fertilized ammonia and acetylene. And if you do that, you get a sort of red material. Uh, and if you use that as a priori, that works pretty well, actually. Um, uh, we, we, we take that as the a priori imaginary refractive index, and we do adjust it slightly. But that seems to be it. And it seems to, be, it seems to work pretty well at all levels. So he's got retrievals now where he's retrieving a sort of a cloud at one bar or so, uh, and then also then a, um, a, a quantity of this chromophore material. Um, which is s which seems to sit above the main cloud in the belts, but is is not there at the uh, in the zones. Do you have a question, Ben? Yeah, I mean, I mean, w w one thing surprises me on your internet, the, the main cloud, uh, two three bar, it's really uniform. It's, it seems to be the same everywhere. It doesn't seem to change much in height. Um, but obviously, you do get these sort of uh, discrete features here, which uh, uh, are at the mid-latitudes, where I guess it's sort of it's uns it, the, the stability is less, and so you do get some sort of thermal um, moist convection at that point there. Um, but I'll say that the, 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 
these things are thought to be methane ice, but they're not very th optically thick, and they're not, not massively thick. And it's not like um, taking a thunderstorm cloud from the uh, base of the atmosphere and taking all that methane and, con and condensing it in a big, huge uh, thunderstorm column. Um, th th these are more sort of detached areas. So, so, so you have a sort of, you get to the methane co condensation level, all the methane goes, there's no cloud, apparently. And then, but obviously there's, there's, there's still methane in the atmosphere, and then uh, higher up, at sort of like the 500 millibar level, there seems to be some kind of instabilities which forms a, a local convection at that point, and then the methane that's in that column will condense, and so you get these sort of uh, clouds there. But obviously you're starting off with a lot less methane, and so you get, you get a thinner optical depth cloud. So the circulation does definitely um, guide where you see these methane clouds. Any other questions? Um, why is that? Um, got to judge my memory banks now. Um, there's a simple answer to that. Um, oh, there we go. Um, it's um, yes. So uh, there seems to be s so Titan's atmosphere. It's um, it's nitrogen and methane. Um, it turns out it's just got just enough methane for the greenhouse effect to keep it warm enough to keep the methane in the atmosphere and the, and the ammonia in the, in the, uh, the nitrogen in the atmosphere. If it were slightly cooler, then uh, the whole atmosphere would freeze out, would go. Um, so then the question is, uh, why are we seeing the atmosphere now? Um, and it could be that there's, there's like cryovolcanism, which sort of uh, injects methane into the atmosphere and then makes it warm enough to get the rest of the atmosphere up. Um, or there's obviously there's obviously ev evidence for uh, methane and ethane lakes, so, so there could be a huge sort of subsurface um, thing. I, I think th there's going to be some sort of tidal heating, I guess, from, uh, from Saturn. And, and, and also, it's Titan is big. So it's, it's, it's managed to hold on to a lot of its sort of stuff and not get too cold. Um, but I can't give you any more detail than that. So. Any other questions? If not, let's thank Pat again. The next speaker couldn't make it in person, so I think we're doing a recorded talk, and uh, Daniel will set this up, and it might take a couple minutes. Hello all, thanks so much to the organizers for not only giving me the chance to talk, but also setting up this whole very technologically magical Wizard of Oz presentation style, as I wasn't able to make the workshop in person. So today I'm going to talk to you about some work I, Caitlin Loftus, have been doing with Robin Wordsworth and Caroline Morley on how we can exploit the sulfur cycle to learn about surface water on exoplanets. One of the big excitements of our growing ability to observe and characterize exoplanets is the chance to place Earth quantitatively into the context of the larger universe. We want to be able to understand occurrence rates of rocky planets with abundant liquid surface water, like Earth, because to our present understanding, these conditions are key for the development of life. Answering our Earth's rare is the first step in answering is life, or at least life as we know it, rare. This goal leaves us with the question of how can we obtain observational constraints on liquid surface water when, for the near future at least, our observations of rocky planets are limited to atmospheres and bulk planetary parameters. We need some way to couple the observable atmosphere to a planetary surface. 
Let's search for inspiration very locally within our solar system, where we have two rocky planets, Earth and Venus, which look essentially the same in terms of bulk planetary parameters that we can observe for exoplanets, but obviously have very different surfaces. How might we distinguish Earth and Venus via their atmospheres? Okay, well, one of the defining characteristics of Venus's atmosphere is its optically thick sulfur haze layer. And that actually turns out to be a pretty promising feature for our goal. Sulfur haze is an observable atmospheric feature because of how, hair, of how aerosols scatter light. And the sulfur cycle is a mechanism that couples the atmosphere to the surface. So can we tie in the presence of surface water to the presence of aerosols to complete our link of the observable atmosphere to liquid surface water? I'll spend the rest of my talk trying to convince you that the answer is yes. But here, let me take a second to sketch out why we might expect that yes. Highly soluble sulfur is preferentially stored in the ocean over the atmosphere. We need to get significant quantities of sulfur gas into the upper atmosphere in order to get aerosol formation to create a haze layer that's observable. But adding an ocean, which acts as effectively a sulfur storage center, will mean we require many orders of magnitude more sulfur than in a system without an ocean to create an equivalent observable haze layer. At some point, the planetary surface will run out of sulfur and making enough aerosols for an observable layer won't be possible. So with this qualitative argument in place, we now want to investigate more quantitatively and more in depth, can a planet with an ocean sustain a radiatively significant sulfur haze layer? I.e. relating this back to our original intent of constraining liquid surface water, can the observation of an optically thick sulfur haze layer diagnose the absence of a liquid water ocean. We're going to start by asking what does a sulfur cycle look like on a wet planet, aka one with a water cycle and stable liquid surface water. We can think about different reservoirs of sulfur within our sulfur cycle. First, there is the interior versus the surface. Then on the surface, we have sulfur in four main areas, the lower atmosphere, the upper atmosphere, surface rock, and our ocean, which we're assuming is present. Melt from the interior outgasses sulfur to the surface. This gas then reaches the upper atmosphere via mixing, where photochemistry and microphysics can then conspire to convert it into aerosols. Depending on their size, these aerosols either gravitationally settle or dynamically mix out of the upper atmosphere into the lower atmosphere. On a dry planet, our only paths to the removal of this atmospheric sulfur are slow reactions between the gas and surface, or aerosols that don't evaporate during their time in the lower atmosphere and settle onto the surface. However, on a wet planet, the, oceans, the ocean wants to dissolve sulfur gas until Henry's Law is satisfied. This equilibrium between the atmosphere and the ocean is strongly dependent on pH, but for expected near-neutral pHs for large bodies of water in contact with rock, we're talking about millions or billions of times the amount of sulfur in the ocean versus the atmosphere. Additionally, both sulfur gas and aerosols are rapidly removed from the lower atmosphere via precipitation. So in our wet sulfur cycle, both the atmosphere-ocean equilibrium and rain limit our ability to form aerosols. Now, you'll probably notice that I didn't mention any specific sulfur species involved in that sketch, and that's because sulfur is, a very, flexible, is very flexible in terms of redox chemistry, as it's stable between negative two and positive six oxidation states. So precise sulfur species involved in the cycle depend on the redox states of the interior, the atmosphere, and the ocean. We focus here on an oxidized atmosphere where SO2 is the dominant gas and H2SO4 water aerosols are the dominant aerosol species. We choose the oxidized atmosphere because the species are more soluble and thus more tightly coupled to the presence of water, and also because the photochemistry involved is better understood. Note we don't assume our hypothetical planets are necessarily as oxidized as modern Earth. With these thoughts in mind, we build a conceptual model of the oxidized sulfur cycle that greatly simplifies its component processes. Our model works by beginning from the premise of an observation of a sulfur haze, rather than beginning from initial conditions and advancing time forward. We first calculate the critical mass of, 
of aerosols necessary for an optically thick upper haze layer, assuming the atmosphere and ocean are at equilibrium. Two, translate that mass into a critical moles of sulfur in the ocean and atmosphere system. And then three, compare the resulting critical value to the expecting moles of sulfur in the surface reservoir to see if that ratio is reasonable. So first, let's confirm the observational potential of our modeled surfler haze layer. Here's Caroline Morley's simulated transmission spectra for the same Earth-like planet with and without an optically thick sulfur haze layer. We, unsurprisingly, see substantially different spectra. Determining our haze layer is composed of H2SO4 water aerosols is a bit more complicated of an argument than we have time for in this brief talk, but ultimately we think it's doable. I can discuss this more during questions if people are interested, but for now, onto our model's results on ocean and sulfur haze layer compatibility. This contour plot will show a summary of our results when we use the strictest assumptions possible to basically the point of unphysicalness to try to encourage the formation of a haze layer. On the x-axis, we have pH because it's crucial in determining ocean sulfur storage potential. And on the y-axis, we have number of Earth oceans in log scaling, where the center is one Earth ocean. The color bar shows the log base 10 of the amount of sulfur we need in the atmosphere and ocean to get an observable haze layer versus how much sulfur we expect to be in the surf surface reservoir. More qualitatively, this is a measure of the likelihood of an, of an observable haze layer forming for a given pH and water volume. Adding our color contours with the contour for needed sulfur equals expected sulfur highlighted in white here, we can see that haze layer formation is incompatible with significant amounts of water for the near neutral pHs we expect, even for our strictest assumptions. For Earth pH and volume conditions, we see that we require more sulfur in the ocean atmosphere than we have in the entire planet to form an observable haze layer. Lowering our model assumptions to be more reasonable and physical, e.g. including rainout, we see that observable haze layer formation essentially becomes impossible for even the lowest expected pHs and water volumes. Everything in our pH ocean volume parameter space basically falls into the regime of unlikely to impossible for an observable haze layer to form. The plots I've shown here are for Earth-like temperature, surface pressure, gravity, and atmospheric composition, but our results are fairly insensitive to changes in these planetary scale parameters, suggesting our results are valid for a wide planetary parameter space. Thus, our model indicates that a planet with an ocean cannot sustain a radiatively significant sulfur haze layer i.e. the observation of an optically thick sulfur haze layer can diagnose the absence of liquid surface water. I also just want to explicitly state that we don't necessarily find the converse lack of a sulfur haze layer implies liquid water to be true. Because, for example, you could simply have a planet with insignificant sulfur outgassing. So now to wrap up and summarize, the sulfur cycle is a viable mechanism to couple the observable atmosphere to surface liquid water content because one, thick aerosol haze layers are observable in exoplanet atmospheres, and two, an ocean will preferentially store sulfur over the atmosphere, limiting, limiting upper atmosphere gas available for aerosol formation. Our modeling indicates that the total amount of sulfur required in the ocean and atmosphere for a thick haze is likely unfeasible to impossible depending on ocean pH and size leading us to conclude an observation of a sustained sulfur haze layer indicates the planet has limited liquid surface water. And with that, I'll hopefully be able to take any questions you have. Thank you. Okay, now Daniel's gonna set it up so that we can do questions. Uh, yes, I can. Perfect. We can see you and we can hear you. Okay, great. Uh, we had very nice talk. It went very well. Okay, good. So, uh, <laughs>
Yeah, so I guess we have a few potential candidates that we can think of just from like um, cosmochemical abundances that would be pretty likely at certain temperatures to be volatile and be forming hazes. Um, so the one case we can definitely rule out is sulfur, elemental sulfur hazes that are forming in more reduced environments um, because there's definitely distinct spectral um, signals between the, the more oxidized H2SO4 aerosols and the more reduced S8 aerosols. Um, and then we can also think about uh, like organic hazes. Um, and we could potentially be able to see um, that those would be not very likely if we can see um, high CO2 versus methane um, in the atmosphere. Um, and then additionally, if we have more information on, say, the, the size distribution of the aerosols, we expect the sizes of these sulfate aerosols to be pretty um, narrowly distributed and always spherical, uh, whereas a lot of these more um, exotic photochemical hazes are more like fractal or lumped together, um, which can give you different effects that you'd potentially be able to recover via forward modeling. Um, and also, if we could have the opportunity to look in polarized light, um, we could recover the index of refraction. And that would tell us pretty conclusively that we're looking at sulfuric acid. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So that's yeah. So that's kind of the case we're trying to control for. Um, but basically, we could potentially look at that kind of signal and then disappearance of the signal. So a transient kind of sulf thick sulfur haze layer as potentially a signal that you have kind of an active hydrological cycle to very rapidly remove those aerosols. Um, because we wouldn't expect them to be able to last from kind of like a transient volcanic event for more than a time scale around a year or two. All right, I think that's all for questions. Let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, yeah, coffee break. Meet up back again at 1045.